Thanks, David. Hi, everyone. I am Virginia Drachman, the Arthur Stern Jr. Professor of American History here at Tufts. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to the sixth annual George J. Markopoulos Memorial Lecture Series. I'd also like to welcome Christy Palmer Lawrence, who will talk with us this evening about the life, legacy, and impact of author and naturalist Thornton W. Burgess. First, I'm going to turn this over to Professor Proctor, who will talk briefly about Professor Markopoulos. However, before I let Professor Proctor get started and tell you about how wonderful Professor Markopoulos was, I would just like to say that indeed Professor Markopoulos was a gifted and mm. kind teacher, a beloved member of the Tufts community, and someone who enriched the lives of anyone who mm. was fortunate to know him. Mm. So I am delighted to introduce this wonderful event in his name. Hmm. Okay, turning it over to you, Professor Proctor. Thank you very much, Professor Drachman. Um, very much appreciate and thank you for, for being willing to join us tonight and to welcome everyone to this sixth annual Markopoulos lecture. So my job uh, tonight is to tell you a little bit about um, who George Markopoulos was. Um, I, I feel sometimes pretty strongly that, that you know, lecture series are created, um, awards are created, uh, different kind of memorials are created that, you know, are, are given out that don't ever really pay attention to who they're supposed to honor. And sometimes over time, who something is named for, the person who was named for gets forgotten. And one thing that we've made, you know, a, a part of this lecture series since the very first one uh, is to make sure that we always ground it in the memory of Professor Markopoulos. Mm -hmm. So previous lectures have generally always been focused on his academic interests, um, which were mm -hmm. European diplomatic history, uh, as well as Byzantium. Um, this year, however, we decided to go in a different direction because in addition to being an extraordinary scholar, Professor Markopoulos was also an extraordinary teacher, mentor, friend, um, someone who spent 45 years at Tufts University, someone who really spent the bulk of his life working to support um, and move forward the ambitions and careers of his students. Uh, he was someone who believed fundamentally that every student had something to contribute, uh, that every student had something to offer in the greater kind of uh, scope of understanding the world around us and in understanding the history that created it. And as I was preparing my course on, on Thornton Burgess, and I was I'm privileged to be able to be teaching a, a course on, on Burgess this semester with three really excellent students who have agreed mm -hmm. to join me in that journey for the semester. Um, mm -hmm. We've read Christy Lawrence's book. We've read some of Burgess's work. We read Burgess's autobiography. Um, and as I was preparing for the course and, and thinking about Burgess himself, I began to think about, in a way, some mm -hmm. of the synergies that he shares with with Professor Markopoulos. Mm -hmm. um, first and foremost is that sense of, of accessibility and that sense that there is really nothing beyond the scope of our ability to understand. Mm -hmm. um, as Christy will talk about, you know, Thornton Burgess had a radio show that that was, was shared by thousands, hundreds of thousands of listeners. Um, he reached 5 million um, readers in some of his, his um, daily kind of newspaper bedtime stories. Um, he would get letters that would come in from literally all over the country, from a fifth grader in Wisconsin to, to you know, an adult in somewhere in Massachusetts, um, who would be sharing with him their kind of interpretations, their, their kind of eyewitness accounts of the wildlife that they've been exposed to. And Burgess was always so great about taking those so seriously, about taking those with value, as well as being connected to people like Professor Gross at Bowdoin um, and other scholars. Um, he listened to what the scholar said, but he also listened to what his readers and listeners said um, and tried to make sure that everybody felt valued and listened to. And that's exactly what Professor Markopoulos did 
um, in his 45 years at Tufts. He worked diligently to make sure that every student was listened to. He worked diligently to make sure that you never felt that your opinion was not valued. Um, and he worked diligently to make sure that every student themselves uh, always felt valued. I've been fortunate, I've been at Tufts now for over 30 years, and I've been fortunate to have a lot of, of, of great mentors. Um, someone like Steve Marone, who was kind of helped guide me in the, the scholar I became, um, our American historian, Jerry Gill, who's probably my closest friend at Tufts, um, mm -hmm. who taught me really how to engage with students. Uh, Lucy Germanuelian, an art historian who introduced me, first one to introduce me to Byzantium that George Markopoulos would mm -hmm. then kind of pick up on. Um, but George stands out as someone, you know, from whom I learned how to, to be a teacher, how to be an advisor, how to make sure you valued your students, how to make sure you valued your colleagues, um, and how to, to understand that everyone's opinion mattered. Um, mm -hmm. And he was always someone who you could count on to, to listen to you. Um, and part of what tonight is about is, is celebrating an individual like Thornton Burgess who represents so many of, of those same qualities. Um, Professor Markopoulos again taught here for, for 45 years. Um, even in the very end of his time, um, he retired in 2006, moved to the retirement community of, of Brookhaven, where thanks to Professor Markopoulos, um, who was a bit of a social butterfly as well as many other things, you know, mm -hmm. I um, was privileged to have dinner many times with, with Bradley Washburn and his wife, um, who Amazing. was um, part of the Boston Science Museum, the leader of the Boston Science Museum. His wife was the first woman to climb mm -hmm. Mount McKinley, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yep. But, you know, during that time, Professor Markopoulos was always still involved, still engaged. Um, when he retired, we did a little celebratory newsletter in which I, I got many of his former students to contribute memories of him. And we presented him with the newsletter and, and he, he, he seemed touched, but it was hard to tell. Um, a couple of weeks later, I was over at Brookhaven for dinner and his friend of his came, McCarthy, a former provost here at Tufts, pulled me aside and she said, you know what, George really valued that, that newsletter and all those nice comments. Mm -hmm. He just couldn't understand that he had made that kind of an impact. Mm -hmm. He just couldn't fundamentally believe that people really kind of mm -hmm. saw him in that light. Um, and some of the last things we read in, in Thornton Burgess's biography about some of the honors he received at the end of his life, mm -hmm. um, it was very much the same thing. Some mm -hmm. just didn't realize, you know, the impact that they had had. Um, one of my last memories of Professor Markopoulos, I would visit him every Friday um, mm -hmm. after our, our friend Professor Gill passed away in 2007. Um, Professor Markopoulos fell ill, went into the nursing home wing at Brookhaven, never really got out of it. Um, and pretty much every night that I'd go over and see him, which was every week, he would be kind of communicative, kind of not, um, hmm. not very, you know, responsive some nights. One night in May of 2011, I went over, I was dealing with a major choice. Um, I'd been offered a position in the history department, which would have mean leaving my position in classics. Um, and I really wasn't sure what to do. It was like a major decision. Mm -hmm. um, and I talked to my colleagues in classics. I talked to other friends and I really wasn't sure what to do. That night I walked into towards Professor Markopoulos' room and for the first time in months, all the lights were on, which I thought was odd to say the least. I walked in and for the first time in probably almost a year, he was fully propped up in bed, fully alert. Mm -hmm. um, I walked over to him, you know, said, good evening. He said, so David, I hear from Howard or a mutual friend of ours, um, that you've been offered a new position. I said, yes. And then we spent a good 45 minutes talking about that position. And he convinced me that it was the right thing to do. Um, that was really the last time he was that communicative. Mm -hmm. um, and I could tell by the end, it had taken a lot out of him. But mm -hmm. even not feeling well, even in that last moment, um, he still wanted to do what he thought was in the best interest of one of his mm. students. And that in very many ways is kind of a defining element of who Professor Markopoulos was and what this lecture series in many ways is 
is also meant to represent. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, I'm going to turn you over to our three students, because another tradition of this lecture series is that the students always introduce the speaker. So our three students are first going to introduce themselves, and then they're going to jointly introduce our speaker. So take it away. Thank you, Professor. Um, my name is Isaac Karp. I'm a, a, a senior at Tufts studying history. Hi, I'm Lucy Millman. I'm a senior at Tufts, and I'm studying public health and political science. Hi, I'm Darcy Miller. I'm a senior at Tufts, and I'm studying history. All right, so let me begin by saying welcome, everyone. Today, we're privileged to have Christy Palmer Lawrence for the sixth annual George J. Markopoulos Speaker Series. Ms. Lawrence is the author of Nature's Ambassador, a, defini a definitive biography of the 20th century children's writer and naturalist Thornton W. Burgess, as well as a nonfiction children's book, The Last Heath Head. She received her BA in English from Hobart and William Smith Colleges and her MA in professional writing from the U University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. A freelance writer and editor for over 30 years, Ms. Lawrence has taught writing at several different incredible institutions, including University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, Cape Cod Community College, and the Cape Cod Writers Conference. Not only has she dedicated much of her time to teaching, but she has also worked as a travel writer and, con and um, contributed over um, other works for numerous publications, including Cape Cod Travel Guide, The Boston Globe, Good Housekeeping, and more. Uh, we are beyond lucky to have enjoyed reading Nature's Ambassador throughout the duration of our semester. Mm -hmm. Ms. Lawrence is currently working on a biography entitled Ships and Shards, Dr. George F. Bass and the Birth of Underwater Archaeology. Known as the founder of underwater archaeology, Dr. Bass undertook the seabed excavation of a 3,000-year-old shipwreck off the coast of Turkey in 1960. He is also the founder of the Institute of Nautical Archaeology in College Station, Texas, in Bodrum, Turkey. Lawrence's upcoming biography builds from her work for her master's thesis, in which she utilized interviews with Dr. Bass, ocean explorer and pioneer in the use of deep sea submersibles, Dr. Robert Ballard, Dr. Bardo Arnold, Dr. Kevin Christman, and other maritime science, exploration, and historical authorities. Hmm. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And mm -hmm. now with only a moment of ado while I pull up the PowerPoint, um, we are pleased to to welcome Christy Lawrence to give her talk on Thornton Burgess. So give me one second to get our PowerPoint pulled up and we will get right underway. All right, I think we are good to go. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for the uh, tremendous honor of being here, um, having the opportunity to address you and especially the students. Um, it, it is very special. Uh, I feel a, a great connection with you, uh, having, having read this book and um, really steeped yourselves in the, the story of Thornton Burgess, which I'll hopefully lay out some aspects of it that maybe you have not come across. But I did want to start by saying that, you know, we all know about the imposter uh, syndrome. And if you needed a definition of it, it might be the biographer of a 20th century children's author. Um, who's who's been writing children's books, who's then going to be stepping into the role of speaking in a lecture series that has classically been devoted to Byzantium and Rome and Genghis Khan's armies. Um, but after I got my balance on that idea uh, and understood from um, Professor Proctor a bit more about um, Professor Markopoulos, the, the connection um, between these two uh, was quite powerful. Um, 
Uh, I came to think after four and a half years of working on George Bass's biography, I came to understand and think of him as a, uh, a pioneer environmental educator. He's known as a children's author. He's lesser known, unfortunately, as a, as a naturalist and a conservationist. But the truth is the, the heart and the soul of his work was education. And in that, uh, he shares that heart for education, that heart for students that uh, Professor Markopoulos certainly had. So it's, it's definitely an honor um, to be speaking here uh, at this particular series. Uh, in this uh, initial slide, I've laid out some of the things Burgess was known for as a naturalist, conservationist, uh, the environmental educator, author of 70 books, uh, columns. He's, he's known for these things. Next, please. Next. Um, um, but the, the way that he's known these days is, is much different. In his day, uh, in the early 20th century, mid 20th century, um, Thornton, Thornton Burgess's reputation as a naturalist and a, an a authority on environmental education was considerable. So this, this quote um, was written by uh, Dr. Theodore Reed, um, the National Zoological Park Director, and saying, in the realm of wildlife conservation, there's one name that must not be forgotten. That's a very powerful, unequivocal statement. And he identifies why, as an early uh, proponent of the necessity for public awareness of conservation of our wildlife and environment, we're indebted to him. Um, I used this quote at the very end of my introduction and said, this debt has yet to be paid. So it could be that this lecture will be a piece of the repaying of, of that debt to Thornton Burgess. Next, please. Uh, one thing about Thornton Burgess that struck me, he achieved tremendous success very quickly as a writer. And by mid 20th century, he'd sold, the, the figures are impossible to come by, but 7 million or 10 million. It was an enormous amount of books in addition to uh, the other things that he was writing. He always wrote for children. He didn't, they were no stepping stone for him. They were his audience. And he understood that audience perfectly. So the title of my book, Nature's Ambassador, I didn't have that initially. I felt I would find it. So in my research, I came on an old yellowed, nasty piece of paper that was a script. Somebody had, had saved it and given it to me. And it was uh, a script that he had written an article. Uh, and in that, he said this, I would rather write for and talk to children than be a best-selling novelist. Uh, his commitment to children endured throughout his entire life. So he was uh, born in 1874, died at 91 in 1965. And his last book came out the year that he died. Next. So I think it's important to evaluate when you're, when you're looking at, at a life to understand what produced that life, what, what ground did it spring from. So this is the street Thornton Burgess was born in that, uh, that uh, second house in on the right, that happens to be my house. So I had the advantage of living in his birthplace and being able to really fully understand and absorb the environment uh, that, that Thornton Burgess grew up in. You can see um, this is, it's a village. Um, and I did a talk one time with a Beatrix Potter specialist. We were talking about the two Peter Rabbits and the two authors. And Beatrix Potter grew up in, uh, in wealth and uh, lavish homes and lavish lifestyle. Thornton Burgess grew up simply. Um, and next, please, in the, in the village of Sandwich. Uh, 
the the fact that his father died when he was 11 months old so he never met his father was something as a biographer that was um driven home to me one day i was i was sitting here um uh, and it occurred to me that his mother caroline burgess had walked through my very front door with her child after her husband had died so there were aspects of his life that were were vivid to me. But this woman, I have her slide, not his father's, um, because she was an enduring um, constant in his life. She was a loving mother, but she imbued him with a sense of security, even when they had no security. Uh, they lived in 10 different houses. Thornton Burgess grew up in 10 different houses here in the village. And uh, she, she gave him a sense of security and a sense of looking ahead that there was always some way to cope with things that would, would characterize him. Next, please. So that was a factor in his life, nature and wildlife. He was free to explore. Um, Sandwich is a coastal area. There were, there were streams, marshes, uh, ponds um, and wildlife. And the, the necessity of helping his mother caused him to be out in the world, uh, in nature, um, gathering uh, blueberries and, and other things that could, could help his mother. Um, I'll just give a little, little mention here, the boardwalk there, some of you may be familiar with that in Sandwich, is a very iconic feature of the town. And it, it's a boardwalk over the marsh that leads out to the, to the beach there. Um, this, you students have read Thornton Burgess's um, autobiography, so you read his account at the age of five of walking over this very boardwalk with an adult and with his cousin. And when they got to the other side, the sight that he saw was staggering to him as a little boy. And it would be staggering to any of us. It was a 74 foot blue whale that had washed up in the days of harpooning. This whale had been uh, harpooned and killed and was there. But my point is that, that Thornton Burgess and the experience of nature, the firsthand experience of nature I came to understand how important this was to his writing. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is just a quick look at the, the village. It's, it's compact. Uh, but Thornton Burgess was surrounded uh, not, by, not by any affluence, not by those kinds of supports, but family. He had cousins, he had aunts, his uncles, both his mother and father had lots of family here. And this can't be um, understated, the, the value of community uh, to him. And I came to understand too, that this man's ability to write about nature, what characterizes Thornton Burgess, what distinguishes him, I think, um, not being a, um, an authority in children's lit, but I don't know of others who uh, employ the entire ecosystem the way he does. And I'll, I'll get into that in a moment. And I think the, his knowledge of an animal in the wild being this aware, constantly aware came, he had a deeper understanding than most of us because that was his life as a child. He too, circumstances had required that he um, acquire this kind of awareness. Next, please. So this just gives you a, a timeline. Uh, nature, children writing, uh, indeed, the, that those were the heart and the soul and the core of his life throughout. Um, these are the places that he lived, his childhood here in Sandwich. He left, went to Boston, uh, to Springfield, I'll tell, talk a little bit more about that. And then his later years were spent in, in Hamden. Next, please. So it's interesting to note, um, on the left is Thornton Burgess as a successful journalist. So he left, uh, he left Sandwich, went to Boston, had a few 
had some uh, academic experience learning bookkeeping, which he loathed and despised, and had an opportunity to move to Springfield and take a job. As a uh, young man, he took a tremendous step. And I think this is worth, especially the students here, understanding that Thornton Burgess had, he had worked very hard in Boston at the age of 22. He had a place to live, he had friends, social life, income, and uh, he had really established himself. The opportunity came up to move to Springfield and take a job with a publishing company. This was what he wanted. However, the job, the circumstance was as a, an office boy, suitable not for a man of 22, but a kid of maybe 14 or 15. And he made that decision because he said, I'll be on the lowest rung, but it's the ladder I want to climb. And I just think that some of the decisions that he made that were difficult represent that, that kind of thinking. What is, the, what is the long goal? And he was able to do that. Um, so it's interesting to understand he was tremendously successful as a children's writer. He had absolutely no intention of going in that direction. He was a journalist a very successful journalist in, uh, in Springfield, a booming town and uh, a wonderful, had a wonderful life there. Uh, next please. But things changed. So these, these two women are uh, his two wives. One is, is Nina, uh, the, the lovely young woman uh, he married in, in 1905. As tragedy struck his mother, uh, tragedy also struck him, and Nina died um, the the year after they were married, um, after childbirth, and he was so bereft that he was unable to attend the funeral, which was held in his own house. He was not able to, um, but and then the the woman on the other side is is Fanny. That's his second wife. Both of these women account for uh, requirements on Thornton Burgess. Uh, the loss of his first wife uh, in sorrow, in grief, in anguish, he turned his life to his writing and actually closed himself away from family to a great extent, um, including his, his uh, little boy. Um, but it was it was how he coped through his writing. So he was expanding on that that piece of his life. Um, so his his second wife uh, Fanny, he had married her in full confidence that his life was solid and good. She had two teenagers, so he had acquired three people: himself and his son and his mother. He was supporting then six people. He arrived at work a note on his desk saying your services um, are no longer required, you have two weeks. So he was let go and he had only married two months earlier. So next please. Uh, the desperation that he felt was complete and total. He basically had no income. And Old Mother West Wind had come out the year before it was, um, Oh, it was a lark. It was a, um, a kind of just a fun thing to do. And a little brown editor was looking for um, some material. Thornton Burgess had some stories. And they, they published them as, as Old Mother West went his first book in 1910. The next year, 1911, uh, when catastrophe struck, he was looking everywhere for some means of income. And he began writing children's books. And as you see, um, he wrote uh, 14 um, within a very short period of time. Next, please. Uh, at the same time he was writing the children's books, this went hand in hand with a daily newspaper column, which attributed significantly to his success. Uh, at one point, Thornton Burgess's newspaper columns uh, his animal stories were in 100 newspapers around the country and in Canada. 
uh, at the end of his life, he had of his writing life, he had written 15,000, which any writers in the audience know is a staggering amount of writing. Um, so these two, the the books that he was writing and the um, and the newspaper columns, next please gave him um, something that was um, absolutely critical to every aspect of his life. Um, and that was his audience. Um, he, was, he was a household name, he was well known. And the, the fact is that for Thornton Burgess, being a literary figure was not important to him but it was a platform for him. And he absolutely understood that. Uh, the, the point of, of his stories was the presentation of, of nature. And so these two aspects, audience and his subject matter, were what fueled his success in literature and conservation and in environmental education. Next, please. This quote uh, says, says it all. Gradually, I woke to the understanding that entertainment was incidental, merely the means to an important end, that I was in possession of a master key to education, that nature is a universal teacher. So Thornton Burgess wrote an article in 1924 in a very important magazine, Nature Magazine, and some of the leading conservationists in the countries also had articles in that. And his article was on nature is the universal teacher. He believed that ch children learned uh, better about nature through nature than through any other means. Um, and he made full use of this in, deliberately in his books. So the, the, I have uh, The Adventures of Bobby Coon there. That was a book, um, uh, the, uh, the president of the uh, Sierra Club, David Brower, has a full chapter on Thornton Burgess in his autobiography. And he cites this book, The Adventures of Bobby Coon by Thornton Burgess as turning his thinking to understanding uh, the, the world of nature, the world of, of animals and wildlife. So the, in the, 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 the lower part there, that's Stu Parsons, Parsons, some of you may know him. Um, he was the, uh, the first naturalist at the Thornton Burgess Society in Sandwich. And Stu, I will never forget, told me one time that he said, animals are just the most amazing uh, teaching tool. He said, I would walk into a classroom, the kids would be, chatter, 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 nobody paying any attention to me. And I just stand there and I kind of wait. And then I'd have a frog in my pocket and I'd bring out the frog, silence. And he had the full attention of, of the class with, with an animal. And this, this um, phenomenon is something that Thornton Burgess understood and utilized beautifully. Next, please. Um, I, I just wanted to mention this for any, any writers uh, or biographers uh, who may be here, that um, when you're writing a biography, you don't exactly know, you're not in total control of what you are going to come up with. And I was well aware that Thornton Burgess had a Peter Rabbit, and of course, Beatrix Potter had a Peter Rabbit. But the, uh, the, I could ignore this and just kind of downplay it and, and move on to other things, or I could deal with it. So I, I decided that it was a subject that, that needed to be explored. Thornton Bird is always credited, by the way, Beatrix Potter, um, with, the, uh, with the character, the rabbit character. Um, but it was important to establish this. And a Smithsonian researcher said, as far as she knows, that nature's ambassador is the only place where this, um, this piece of potential plagiarism um, at the dawn of children's literature is fully explored. 
and and explained, I think, reasonably explained, um, the rules were different in those days. Um, but anyway, it's it's covered. Uh, perhaps the students might have any questions about that. Next, please. Um, oh, and I just wanted to say too that for researchers, any researchers there, uh, sometimes you come across information that is just yours. You've 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 come on something no one in the world knows. And I was in that position with Beatrix Potter and Thornton Burgess, who committed. Uh, I apologize. I know we need to move on to the natural science, but I I just had to point this out. The two writers of, of Peter Rabbit. Uh, both claimed love, true love, in the same year, same month, give or take, July, June, July. And both of those loves were lost, uh, tragically, um, within a very short period of time. And both writers cite Joel Chandler Harris. Um, it, for any children's lit people, there's a fuller discussion of that uh, but this isn't the place for it, but it's extremely interesting. Um, so next, please. Um, this too is one of the most delicious pieces of research. This is a, uh, a quote in a book, um, Road, to, Road to Childhood by Ann Carol Moore, who is this very fearsome, formidable New York Public Library librarian. Um, in the dawn of children's literature, uh, there were a group of women who were establishing the ground rules for this new field of, of literature. And Thornton Burgess was writing a few too many books to suit them. There was not that literary quality that they, they approved of. So Anne Carol Moore did not, was not a great fan of Thornton Burgess's for that reason. And but she was writing a, um, a Christmas review one time and she asked this child to come into her office, child reader she respected, patron at the library respected very much. And she wanted to get his suggestions as a child for what books he was enjoying reading. And the, the child looks around at this room filled with stacks of books and says, is there nothing here by Thornton Burgess? And poor Anne Carol Moore, I can just, you know, hear her asking, aren't there any other books that, you know, do it for you? And uh, so, but lo look at this quote, look at, at what this child said. Thornton Burgess can put it over the others because, and this explains why Thornton Burgess's books are still sold today after a hundred years, which is extraordinary. He sees what I see and I understand his language. And that is quite simply the key to Thornton Burgess's success. Um, uh, a piece of piece of it. Care, uh, move uh, advance, please. Thank you. Um, so I mentioned that he he wrote about a complete ecosystem. So the in his characters, you can see the mammals, the birds, the amphibians. You know, these are all characters. The arachnids. His his character of Madame Orb is absolutely brilliant. And you will learn about how spiders weave spider webs from Madame Orb if you, if you get into that particular book. Um, and the habitat. He writes about woods and trees and streams. And you see his experience back to his childhood. He knew these places intimately. He could describe them. He'd seen the nests. He'd seen the burrows. He'd seen the evasion tactics of one species over another. Uh, so his childhood gave him the knowledge to employ all of these. It was a gift, really, that he didn't have the advantages. Next, please. Um, and as a result of uh, the Thornton Burge's success as a storyteller, he uh, attracted a readership worldwide. Um, this is uh, the, the cover is a Reddy Fox uh, story in, in Japan. Um, 20 Burgess books were translated into Japanese and then based on their tremendous popularity, a 1973 anime was produced 
and ran once a week for a full year. And then in 1979, it was converted uh, at, or re reissued, I should say, as Fables of the Green Forest, which you can still see. Um, but I, I, I came on Fables of the Green Forest in uh, on YouTube and someone had, had commented, I never thought I'd, I'd hear the theme song of Fables of the Green Forest. And this person was from Romania. Uh, so the, the breadth of Thornton Burgess's audience um, is, is very impressive. I mean, I, I called a, a, a nuanced software technician in Seattle one time and mentioned Thornton Burgess and this man on the other side of the country said, oh yes, uh, my mother loved Thornton Burgess. So I, I feel like finding this connection with Thornton Burgess is, is very easy. And it's based on those, those two things. Um, his his audience and his well his understanding of his audience and his use of nature. Next, please. Um, in conservation, Thornton Burgess played an extremely important role. And it, again, it was it was the size, the scope of his audience that became uh, noticed by and deeply impress uh, impressive to. Uh, people like William Hornaday, who was a um, an arch uh, conservation activist. Uh, and when Thornton Burgess first came to him, he really didn't have time for him. But he, he then understood Thornton Burgess, oh, he was the one who's writing all these books. His name is a household name. And it wasn't just that, it's that Thornton Burgess was writing for children about nature, about wildlife. And Thornton Burgess's passion was really love of wildlife, caring for wildlife, stewardship. So this man, William Hornaday, um, when Burgess offered to help him in passing the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, um, Hornaday said, yes, yes, you can, um, you can write a book that will depict, and, and here is the book, uh, Poor Mrs. Quack. Uh, you can write a book that is going to describe the plight of the migrating bird. Well, Thornton Burgess did that and he did it in heartbreaking style. The, uh, the story is, is intended to grip the hearts of the readers and the, uh, the, the fathers who were hunters uh, found themselves uh, in the unhappy presence of children who were begging them not to go hunting for Mrs. Quack. But um, excuse me, next please. Uh, these were days when um, in the early 20th century where conservationists were up against different issues. On the, on the left there, you see the, the feathered hat and fashion was taking a toll on birds. On the right, you see the, the, uh, the, the Boston game market. And what had happened in the, in the early decades of the 20th century was that cars had provided hunters with, uh, with greater access into, wild, into the areas, the habitat of wildlife. And gun power was changing as well. So things were increasingly stacked against um, the, the wildlife creatures. And next, please. Um, and so uh, Thornton Burgess's efforts were, were greatly appreciated. Uh, one person who understood the value also of Thornton Burgess was Ada Fleming. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the International Kindness Club. Apparently they're still, they're still in operation. But Ada Fleming founded that. Um, Albert Spicer was the um, the uh, um, uh, sponsor, and she consulted with Thornton Burgess as uh, on his techniques, his his um, his content for environmental education. And Thornton Burgess, in this middle paragraph here, is writing to her and say, talking about the Massachusetts law 
against uh, steel traps and that he had advocated for that and was very disappointed when it was when it was undermined. But he says, we must rely on educating the public, especially the children. So it wasn't a matter of entertaining children. It was never, maybe in the beginning it was, but by the end of the, uh, the 19 teens, he fully understood um, what he was doing, and he was advocating for nature and for wildlife. Next, please. So environmental education for Thornton Burgess uh, took on a different focus in the 1920s. Radio had come out. Um, one of the first programs was through Westinghouse, and Thornton Burgess was invited uh, to read uh, some of his stories on uh, WBZ in, in Springfield. And they became very popular. And then he said, well, looking to advance the educational value of his stories, he said, I'd like to be able to talk a little bit about the animals that are within the stories and give more on that. That went over well. His audience was just growing by leaps and bounds. And he then came up with the idea of the Radio Nature League. And this would be an organization uh, membership um, would require pledging to support wildlife. And within two weeks, Thornton Burgess had, I think it was something like 50,000 people had signed on. It was, it was massive. I, I may have my figures here. Maybe the students can correct me, but um, it was, it was a, a huge amount and it was instantly popular. Uh, but not only children were signing up for the Radio Nature League, which was on once a week, um, but conservationists, science, adults. Um, and Thornton Burgess absolutely used his Radio Nature League as a platform. Next, please. Um, it, was, it was near and dear to his heart that radio at its inception could be used to advance science. And a Smithsonian scientist who was, who was a friend of his, um, Austin Hobart Clark, also believed these, these two young men um, saw the possibility of radio just as young people when the internet came out, you know, began to see its potential. These two specifically saw the potential of radio to advance science. So I put up a few quotes here, one by Austin Clark um, that says, and, and the, the highlighted area, if it reaches scores of thousands who seldom or never read the printed page, but whose thirst for accurate information is insatiable. Um, and that was the point. This, the radio uh, came into being, became publicly accessible in a time when our country was changing. The, uh, the agrarian focus was, was changing. The war had, had had that that kind of an impact. And um, the, the point of radio being able to provide information to people who often were knowledgeable about nature, but this insatiable thirst was um, very specific. What is this caterpillar in my backyard? What is this butterfly? Um, why does this happen? And Thornton Burgess provided a platform for those questions for children, for adults. And he was having Smithsonian scientists like Austin Hobart Clark and others on his program, answering questions, creating an interface for scientists and his, and his tremendous audience. So the, the, the power of education that Thornton Burgess wielded was considerable. And then here, here you have this other quote, Washington Post, the possibility of radio as a direct and practical aid to science has been demonstrated during the last year by Thornton Burgess. So it was acknowledged that this is what he was doing with his radio program. Next, please. Um, so these are some of the ways I've, I've listed on the right there uh, that Burgess was actively promoting science and conservation. This is a piece of, of this man that is far lesser known than the adventures of uh, uh, Jimmy Skunk and, um, and Peter Rabbit. That's, that's how he's significantly known, but he was promoting 
science and nature and environmental education in all these different ways. Next, please. Um, so the, the Bowdoin connection, um, uh, Professor Proctor mentioned this, um, is, is pretty interesting. So Thornton Burgess had his radio program and this belief that it could aid science. So he learned from uh, Alfred Gross, I think at a conference, that he was looking for specimens. He was doing a study on the rough grouse on parasites. And Thornton Burgess said, aha, I will get, I will ask my audience to provide you with specimens of the rough grouse. It was hunting season. And so Alfred Gross was overwhelmed. He had, he got not, uh, 300 uh, specimens from Thornton Burgess's audience and others. And he was expecting maybe 40 or 50 specimens to be able to study. It was the beginning of a friendship. It was an enduring friendship between these two men. And uh, a few years later, uh, Alfred Gross had been hired by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to study the heath hen. This is, this is a heath hen in the, the mating posture, tail up, the classic inflated uh, air sacs on the side of its neck. What looks like ears are actually feathers that in the, in the mating stance, the, this is what the male heath hen does. The ears go up. Uh, the feathers go down. But um, this species uh, that once ranged from Maine to um, around Virginia um, became uh, uh, scarcer and scarcer for a ver variety of reasons and ultimately was isolated on the island of Martha's Vineyard off the Massachusetts coast. And um, so Thornton Bird, uh, Alfred Gross was hired to make a study of the, of the heath in its, in its decline. It had gone from thousands to hundreds to dozens. And when Alfred Gross began studying it, it was in the dozens and then down to three. And then ultimately there was only one bird that remained. Next, please. And Thornton Burgess had come to help um, Alfred Gross do that study. Um, of, of the heath hen, uh, and they banded that, that last bird. So this picture is near and dear to me. Um, I don't know about you, but when you find that the public has done something as dramatic as this, I, I find it utterly intriguing. So this is a picture of the 30 attendees at the Matamac Environment, uh, Environmental Conference on Biological Cycles in Labrador. And uh, the, if you count, Thornton Burgess is number six. You can't really see faces. I apologize for that. But the original, you couldn't see them either. And Alfred Gross is number seven. But this is a gathering of elite scientists from, uh, from Scotland, from England, from Germany, from Canada, from the US. And they were gathered together by a Boston businessman who wanted to understand why the salmon were fluctuating, why there were cycles. And so, and in this quote here by Thornton Burgess, the, the last part of that says, uh, uh, so they could make possible accurate forecast of years of maximum and minimum numbers of a given species. So how timely is this? This was a gathering of elite scientists. If it had been elite writers, Thornton Burgess would have enjoyed himself, but he was in his glory in the company of these people. He, he went for walks with them. He talked, his friend Alfred Gross, the two of them just had the, the best time. He had not been invited as Alfred Gross's uh, uh, guest, but What's impressive, I mean, there's so many things impressive about this, that a Boston businessman set up this conference because he was curious about the environment. Um, but Thornton Burgess soon realized that all of these elite scientists knew who he was. He didn't know who they were. They all knew who he was. And that was the extent of his, his reputation. Um, next, please. So, 
this is this is a very sweet and a very dear picture. And this is the man that um, uh, Professor Proctor referenced earlier. The man on the right there is Alf uh, I'm sorry, is uh, Bradford Washburn. Um, and on the left is his wife, the woman uh, who was the first to climb. I, we both believe it was Mount McKinley. But um, Bradford Washburn was an extraordinary individual who was a mountain climber, a photographer, but he sort of single-handedly resurrected the Boston Museum of Science. So he's a revered figure uh, at the museum. And in the, um, I, I'm actually not too sure, it was, it was hmm, maybe in the, it was in the early 60s. And a trustee wanted to honor Bradford Washburn and said, well, we'll create a, uh, an annual award uh, in your name. And this was great, but they were looking over the list of the recipients and uh, uh, Melville uh, Grosvenor was the, was the first recipient. Um, but Bradford Washburn said, you know, there are people who were so important to me. Um, I, I'd like to honor the, the people who, who directed uh, my, my, my passion and my work. So he named um, uh, Kirtley Mather at Harvard, Gilbert Grosvenor at the National Geographic Society and Thornton Burgess, a children's writer. And so the legacy of an educator uh, is, is in the individuals I spoke with, so many whose life work had been undertaken because of the children's books that they had read and the, the love of nature that was, was in them and instilled in them. But I think Thornton Burgess made nature comprehensible. Again, that quote, uh, he sees what I see and I understand what he said. So Thornton Burgess was able to translate. It wasn't stuffy, uh, stuffy information about nature. It was stories and that was, that was his gift. And the legacy of an educator is to have their passions carried on and students, perhaps you will be carrying on the passions of your professors. So next, please. These are my two books on Thornton Burgess. One, um, The Nature's Ambassador. The Last Heath Hen uh, is gonna be coming out in June. And the last slide is just some contact information if anybody wanted to get in touch. So that's all. This has just been a, a glorious opportunity for me. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm going to adjust our security settings here. So anybody who wishes to start their video um, may feel free to do so. Um, any, any questions? Yes, any questions? Well, I'll kick off with one question oh. uh, kind of to start the ball rolling a little bit. <laughs> um, so you, you talked a lot about, um, about his role as a, as a naturalist, um, the, the kind of scientific communities that he had interactions with. Um, what didn't you have time to talk about or what stands out to you is maybe in addition to the conference that, that you told us about, uh, maybe another uh, a trip that he took or another kind of uh, venture that he had with, with oh. Dr. Gross that maybe yeah. really resonated with you when you were doing your well, research. Well, that's, that's a sweet question um, because in writing a biography of someone, you, you, you really have to live with that person. And so there was one such trip with Alfred Gross that Thornton Burgess made. And I thought to myself, this is the happiest this man has been in his entire life. And the two of them were in Labrador. They were scrambling over rocks. They were counting birds. They were looking at eggs and nests. It was cold. It was nasty. And the two of them were in their absolute glory. And so that's the sort of thing, thank you for asking that, uh, that um, 
is memorable to me in terms of, uh, you know, just a, a trip, which you mentioned. But he went to Panama with Alfred Gross as well. Um, and they were, uh, Alfred Gross was an ornithologist. Burgess referred to himself as an amateur naturalist um, in writing about um, George Bass, the issue of who's an archeologist and who's an amateur archeologist, who's an ornithologist <clears throat> and who's an amateur. Uh, sometimes the level of experience, uh, Dr. Pro uh, uh, Professor Proctor, maybe you can speak to this too. You, I'm sure you've run into this. When the level of expertise drives a person's credentials up, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, other questions? Well, Well, I, I have one more, sorry, but there's just one more. Um, <laughs> that, you know, I've, I've read Thornton Burgess's book since, since I was a child, you know, and what, you know, both my wife and I have found interesting is that they're not as available in some way, they're still available, but not necessarily as available now as they might've been 10, 15 years ago. Mm. But also you're hard pressed to find him talked about in, in, you know, collections of children's writers and things like that. And I was wondering if you could maybe give us a little insight since you've really lived with him for so long now mm -hmm. as to why you feel this might be the case. Uh, that's a wonderful question. And it actually is the heart of uh, my breaking out into a cold sweat as a biographer. When I had a book assignment uh, a book contract, and I'm looking in the anthologies of children's literature, and this is this is my subject. Where is he? And I, I'm also likewise looking in the books of of uh, naturalists, and where is he? And I think it's um, this lack was pointed out. I I do have a theory about the explanation, but. Um, the lack was pointed out by one reviewer uh, named John Goldthwaite, um, who, who spoke uh, at length about Burgess, and he commented on the lack of uh, discussion about him. Frank Baum, you can find information about him. Um, I think I, I came up with this theory and perhaps a student scholar will be exploring this at some point. That is my hope. But that, so here are two fields, Thornton Burgess in children's literature, Thornton Burgess as a, as a naturalist, an environmental educator. He was at the height here, phenomenally successful, and at the height here. If he'd been less of a children's writer, this would have been more acceptable to the to the naturalists and the scientists. If he'd been, if he'd been more of a children's writer, dedicated in the field and less in into natural science. But the naturalists mid twentieth century who were writing the the anthologies were hard pressed to embrace the uh, the author of. Uh, children's stories with um, uh, clothed animals who were who were talking. Time things changed, um, and the as far as children's lit goes, I think that I personally, again, oh, it is my dream that a researcher will come along, look into this, and actually document. I I documented to my satisfaction as a as a biographer. I do feel that the sense of Burgess, there was a disapproval among the, uh, the founders of the field of children's literature. Um, and they absolutely adored um, Beatrix Potter, for, for example. Um, but Burgess was too, too commercial. He, he felt too commercial. Um, and the, the point the heart and soul of his work, that environmental education, I feel both groups have missed. And so where is Thornton Burgess in, in the history? Uh, 
it's it's really pretty amazing. Um, and let me just see, there was a review of, of Nature's Ambassador in Envi Environmental History uh, Magazine, which is quite a prestigious publication. And I was told I'd be really lucky to get it reviewed in there. And, and I was quite happy with that. But the reviewer, Kevin Armitage said, the life of Burgess highlights an ongoing issue in understanding conservation and environmentalism, the role of sentiment in motivating wildlife protection. And I think, actually, I looked over that tonight and I thought, you know, I think it's the role of, of uh, humaneness. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not sentiment so much. It reads like it, I, I know that. But his goal was to create a heart for nature. And he was tremendously successful, but that success is not recorded in the, in the annals of children's literature or I, in uh, you know, the, the, uh, the histories of early 20th century naturalists and conservationists. So good question. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, any last questions before we wrap up for the evening? Feel free to unmute yourself, raise your Zoom hand, whatever works for you. I have one small question. comment. This oh, is, go right ahead. This is Chris Fry. Um, about being um, necessarily forgotten, not necessarily, but uh, not, uh, out of memory, I guess. Overlooked, perhaps. That, yes, that, was, that wasn't very uncommon. I can't, I don't see why that would be that uncommon. Unfortunately, there were so, in that time period, you had uh, George Grinnell, you had um, mm. John, um, uh, uh, John Burgess, or not Burgess, uh, Burroughs, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, of course, Hornaday and um, you had the whole, like the Migratory Bird Act. Uh, there were many, many people involved with that. And mm. it, it was, um, and a lot of those people are just not recognized mm. or remembered necessarily. Some are. Uh, Hornaday is probably one of the, uh, but he was rather boisterous. Oh yeah. Uh, but um, the most defiant because, devil is the is the name of his yes. uh, biography. So, yes. Yeah. But uh, they all work together pretty well. Um, and uh, but uh, Thornton Burgess definitely stands out. Mm, definitely does. Yeah. And thank you for the invite. Mm, you're welcome. Uh, any other questions? comments before we wrap up. All right, then. Well, I want to thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you, Christy, for a really excellent lecture. That was fascinating um, and, and very informative. And we're so delighted you were able to, to join us this yeah. evening. So I want to thank everyone for attending um, and hope you have a, a good weekend and a good rest of your Friday. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Really thank enjoyed you. the lecture. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So, Professor Proctor, can we stay for a moment after? Of course. Of course. Let everybody make their way out and then yeah. we can stay for a moment.